Okay, the topic of uh, this session, as you see, is this world and the world to come. In Hebrew, ha'olam hazeh ve'ha'olam haba. And what we will try to cover, we'll see, it's up to the time, and your patient, and my patient, uh, is clarification of the, of the notions. What is, what is the meaning, what's behind the, what is the concept of ha'olam hazeh? And what is ha'olam haba? I will start with um, a declaration that will seem probably very interesting and funny uh, for many of you. And this is the following declaration. The world to come is not the world when after 120, the soul separates from the body. So the destination of the soul, the next, st the, the next station or the next state is not Ha'olam Abba. Is not. After 120, the soul goes and the Shama goes to a place called Olam HaNeshamot. We have to understand, to define what is a Olam Azeh, what is a Olam Abba. Let's start from this. And I will start from a very interesting place. <clears throat> it's actually in the Torah, but we have to just remember or know or learn the following. The Torah, the Chamisha Chumshay Torah, the Sefer Torah that we have in Aron HaKodesh in the in the shul, Sefer Torah include Sefer, includes Sefer Bereshit, Shmot, Vayikra, Bamidbar, Dvarim, but the information in it divided to four layers, to four levels, to four dimensions, which are, in Hebrew, the initials are Pardes, Pshat, Remez, Drash, and Sod. To translate, Pshat is the simple understanding of the text, if you understand the language, you could get an idea about what the information in the simple level talking about. The deeper level, called the level of remez, to translate to English, a hint. A hint is a whole level of information that is in the text, but in hints. Different kind of hints, the initials, the beginning of every word, the end of every word, jumping in in the text between uh, letters, then you could read a whole different kind of information. The level that is deeper than this is the level called drash. And about this, just few words. Drash, to translate to English, is demand or search both in Hebrew lidrosh ze levakesh to search to look for or to demand ani doresh i'm demanding okay so this those are the, the translation of the word the deepest level is the secret the sod the secret which is People called it not in the very precise way. Mysticism, Kabbalah, the secrets, okay? Now, there is a different way to divide the Torah. Instead of four levels to two levels, the revealed and the hidden. Hanigle v'anistar. Now, look at this. You will understand soon why I'm saying all of this. <clears throat> if we take ourselves, we have a revealed part of us, which is the body. We have a hidden part of us, which is the soul. We do not see our neshama, our soul. The senses are very good tools to relate to the physical dimension. The way to realize that you have something Beyond that is not the senses. You could not see in your flesh eyes or hear or feel the neshama in one of the physical senses. But we could use our logic, which is the function of the upper level of us, 
to realize that we have something more than just body. Okay? Now, the rule in the Torah is the following. When Hashem gave us the Torah, the Torah is a very unusual book. It's not a human wisdom, but the divine wisdom. It's the wisdom of God. Therefore, the book is very complicated and rich and includes a lot of information in different levels. <clears throat> the rule is the following. When we talk about the simple level of the Torah, the simple level, the Gemara says about it, Dibra Torah Beleshon Bnei Adam. The Torah speaks because the Torah in the simple level are, is our directions. This is the meaning, the translation of the word Torah. Toreli et aderech, show me the way, meaning instructions. And in the Torah, of course, we have instructions, the laws, the tariag mitzvot, right? Because the Torah talking to us, it was given to us by God in a way that we could relate to, in the language that we could understand, not just the language, but the concept. I mean, the ideas are much bigger than what you see. And this is the, those are the deeper, deeper levels, okay? Now, the rule is the following. In the Torah, in the simple level of the Torah, there are many, many instructions or information that relate to the physical aspects of the human being, of the human life. Everything that relates to the abstract, to the uh, spiritual, <coughs> mentioned in the simple level of the Torah, but with very few words that you could not really understand from what you read, what is the concept that they're talking about. And here we come, because in this lecture we're gonna go, we're gonna speak about the spiritual dimension of the universe. Therefore, the information will be mentioned in the simple level of the Torah in the words, in, you know, very few, no understanding of them, but in the Kabbalah, in the secret, in the hidden part, there is a lot of information about everything that is not physical. Let me give you an example. To understand who we are, we have to go to the Torah, to the second perek, second chapter, Pasuk Zayn, the seventh verse in the second pe uh, chapter in the Torah. I will just uh, tell you what's written over there. The Pasuk says, Vayitzer Hashem Elokim, Vayitzer Elokim, Hashem Elokim et Adam Afar Mina Adama, Vayipach Be'apav Nishmat Chayim, and Hashem created the first man. He took dust from earth. And that was the source of the physical dimension, which is the body. But to this, Hashem put neshama, nishmat chayim. Now, aside from the word neshama, we have no clue what is this thing. The body we see. We could feel. You know, biology searching what is the body. But nobody knows what's the neshama. Even if you know that you have a neshama, you have no way to know what is this. What's the essence of it? Right? So in the simple level of the Torah, aside from the word neshama, we do not have any further information. But in the Kabbalah, there is many, many details about this. Now, because in this lecture we want to speak about this world and the world to come, I want to just, after this... Uh, Hakdama, this uh, few words before, will show you what I mean when we go to the Torah itself. When you read the simple level of the Torah, you could, in the beginning, of course, I hope, uh, I assume everybody knows, the first chapter of the Tanakh, of the, of, the, of the Torah, right? The description of the creation. Bereshit bara elokim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Hashem created heaven and earth in the beginning, okay? Now, the next passage says that the heaven and earth was in a state, a state of chaos. And then the entire first chapter described the order that Hashem did in the sixth day of the creation by ten times that he said, he spoke and it happened. 
He made an order in the physical dimension of the universe, right? Now, if we finish the first chapter, going to the first few verses of the second chapter, those are very famous psukim that everybody over here knows because we sang this few times every Shabbat in the Tefillah and in the Kiddush, right? Vayechulu. Okay, let's go to look at those famous psukim, but I want to show you something very interesting in here. Hinted and in the drash and the so the secret is the story of this world and the world to come. Let's see. I will read the Hebrew, which is the original. You have here the translation. I will translate it in a way, but look at this. And I emphasize this, the word asa. Because it speaks about the seventh day, right? The seventh day, of course, comes after the sixth. Therefore, in the seventh, when you want to relate to the things that happened before, he called it, he has done, right? He had done, which he had done, we speak from the seventh day back to the sixth day that were before. Therefore, it's very understood why it's in, a, no, that's too much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Why he speaks about it in a past, right? Continue. Again, the word appear here, in the past, he had done. Then, if you continue, and in Hebrew, la'asot, meaning in the future. So, if you think about it, it's not correct. Why not? Also here, which God created and had done. Because he did it, right? What la asot when there is a, you know, it's talk about the future. So on the simple level, you could understand it. We could explain it in the simple level. But here comes the secret of it. Ramban, the Ramban, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Nachman, Nachman it is, right? On his comments on the Torah, explain it in the simple level. But then he mentioned the deepest level. I want to show you before we see the Ramban, the source of the Ramban. The source of the Ramban is in the Midrash, in the, in, in, in the third level, which is the Drash. There is a Midrash called Tana Deve Eliyahu. This is a very interesting book that was taught to one of the Amoraim in the, Amoraim in the Talmud, Rav Anan, by Eliyahu Anavi. Eliyahu Anavi, Eliyahu the prophet, came to him and learned with him, Chavrutan revealed to him, teach him many, many deep things about the creation. He wrote it in the book, and the book is on the bookshelves of any bookstore, any Jewish bookstore. It's called Tana Deve Eliyahu. The Gemara and Masechet Sanhedrin bring this Midrash and says the following, look at this. Tana Deve Eliyahu, it's Masechet Sanhedrin, Daf Tzadik Zayin Amud Aleph, Page 97, in the first, in the first page, says the Gemara the following. Tana Deve Eliyahu. <coughs> the Tana Deve Eliyahu teaches. Shita Alfe Shneha Alma. For six millennia, the world will exist. And one millennium, destroyed. Don't be scared. It's okay. I I'll explain. For, so what he said over here, that the world going to exist since the time of the creation for 6,000 years. After 6,000 years, the world was destroyed for 1,000 years. And after 1,000 years, Hashem will renew His world. Now here, in few words, in the third level, Pshat Remes Drash, Drash, which is the closest to the Sod, to the secret, Eliyahu Navi teaches us that the world was created for a purpose. This purpose has a time limit, and the time limit is 6,000 years. What's gonna happen after the 6,000 years? 
the world will be destroyed. To calm you down, it will be very close if you know the date today. You know what's the date? We are in the year in the Hebrew calendar, the year 5774. If you take, and this date is to the creation, right? So if you take 6,000 and minus this number, you will get 226 years, which is relatively very close, very close. <clears throat> so why I said that we could be, feel good about it and not be panic, because the destruction that the Medr speaks about over here, destroyed, this destruction is not a destructive, destructive destruction, but a constructive destruction. How? Well, what's the meaning of this? <clears throat> In order to understand this, and then soon we'll, we'll see what the Ramban says about this, we have to understand what happened. If you remember, the first two, three chapters of Sefer Bereshit, after Hashem created the world in six days, right, and then was Shabbat, Hashem created Adam Arishon in the sixth day of the creation, right? He put him in a place called the Garden of Eden. And the Torah described what there is in this garden, three kinds of trees. Kol etz nechmat tov which is the title of many trees, all good, nice trees. That's good for food and nice for the eye to look at, right? That was one kind. Category one, kol etz nechmat lemarev etov lemachal. Category two, ve'etz hachaim betoch hagan. It was one tree with a very unusual name, the tree of life. And it was in the middle of the garden. And another category, category three, which includes also one kind of tree called Etz Hadaat Tov Vara. The tree that gives you the ability to differentiate between good and evil. Okay? Al-Marishon was put in this place and Hashem commanded him and he told him, you see all the trees? Mikol Etz Hagan Achol Tochel. You could, you allowed to eat from all the trees, all of them. But one, and this one is Etz Hadat Ovara. Don't eat from it. That was the first commandment that any human being ever got. And Adam Arishon, as you know, heard the commandment and decided not to obey. And he listened to the Nachash, the serpent, the snake. Actually, the snake with the rider on it. On on it. This way, the Kabbalah dis describe it. You know, it's the, the, the rider of the of the snake of the serpent was what the Kabbalah says, the Sitra Akra, the other side, which is the evil that was riding on it and and convinced Adam and Chava not to listen to Hashem. So the matter says the following Adam Rishon was created in the sixth day, commanded in the sixth day, sinned in the same same day, and chased out of Gan Eden in the same day without seeing the Shabbat. He never got the Shabbat. He missed it. He missed the Shabbat. The Medrash, again I'm quoting another Midrash. The Medrash in, Mas, in Mas Midrash Rabba, the Sefer Kohelet, in the beginning of Sefer Kohelet, the Midrash says the following. Besha'ah, I will say it in Hebrew and then try to translate it. Besha'ah Shebara Kadosh Baruch Hu Adam Arishon, at the time when Adam, uh, Adam Arishon was created, Netalo HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took him for a trip, for a journey in the creation. And he showed him Gan Eden, which is the microcosmos. And he told them, look at all of these things that I created. Kol ma shebarati, lo barati ela bishvilcha. I created it for you. Because before Hashem created Adam Arishon, he says, Adam Arishon was the last creature to be created. And before Hashem created him, it says in the Pasuk that Hashem says, etc. I'm, I'm now going to create something that will not be another element in the big crea creation. I'm going to create my partner to run the world. I created it, 
And now I need a manager, and I'm gonna create this manager. This is the meaning of the word ve'yirdu bitgatayam. Let them control everything, right? So based on this, says the Midrash, I created everything for you. Be responsible, and you have to know that if you manage it, run it in the right way, that will be great. But if will not, you'll not do it, you're going to destroy not just yourself, but the entire creation. Because you are the one, you are the driver. You're going to destroy the vehicle, which is the entire universe. And the Kabbalah explained that when Adam Arishan sinned, he not just caused a damage to himself and made himself mortal. He caused the world to be mortal. Therefore, now there is a deadline. And you have to know again, that was plan B. Plan A, when God created Adam, he didn't create him in order to kill him. He created him in order for him to live forever. This is the meaning of the word, the soul is the soul of life. And the definition, the right, the exact, the accurate definition of life is not what we think life is. We call life the 70, 80, 120 years that we are here in this world, when our soul is inside our body. But that's not the real meaning of life. The exact accurate definition of life is existing forever. This is life. Proof? In Yamim Noraim, we say in the davening, in the tefillah, davening, pray, whatever you call it over here. I'm from Brooklyn. You know, it's davening for us. For you, it's pray. I don't know. Okay? Anyway, in the pray, in Yamim Noraim, we said, we're adding something. What do we say? Zochreinu lechaim. Remember us for a life. Melech chafetz b'chaim. A king who interested in life. Lema'ancha Elohim chaim. And we speak to God, and we said, for you, and we're calling him Elohim Chaim. And because everybody knows that God is not physical, because physical is limited and Hashem is almighty, when we called him Elohim Chaim, we mean existing forever. So when we request or ask Hashem to give us life, we are not just asking, let us live until 120. We're asking much more than that. Let us live forever, like it was in the plan A. Then, because Hashem gave us free will, and Adam Arishan used it not in the right way, <coughs> he brought on himself the concept of death. When Hashem told him, Ki he told him, listen, if you will not listen to me, you will become mortal. Meaning, if you will listen to me, you will never die. Right? Therefore, we, by our action, meaning Adam Arishon, with his action, actually design the way that the world actually will exist. If you will not sin, there is no limit of 6,000 years. Everything was different. But because he did this, it become limited to 6,000. Now the question is, why 6,000? Why not five and a half? Why not four? Why not 17? Why six? What's the meaning of this word? Of this, of this number? And here we go into the Ramban, after all of this. The Ramban says the following, in his comments to this verse in Sefer Bereshit. Asher bara elokim la'asot. Says the Ramban, after he explained the simple, now we go deeper. And he says the following, Veda, you should know, Ki nichlal od bemilat la'asot, Ki sheshet yeme bereshit, Hem kol yemot olam. Why it's mentioned in a term of future, instead <coughs> of past? Because it's in it, in the beginning, in the foundation of the creation. The creation was found in six days, but this is also going to tell you about the time, the frame of the existence of the world. So we have 6,000 parallel to the six days of the creation. Ki, ki 
because the time that this world will exist the way we know it now will be limited to 6,000. Why? And here's the secret. Adam Arishon was created in the sixth day. In the sixth day, he sinned. In the sixth day of the creation, actually, he destroyed a world that was created in six days. According, and here again, we have to know another two major concepts. When Hashem created the world, there are two ways that Hashem is operating, managing the world. It's called Midat Hadin ve Midat Arachamim. The attribute of judgment and the attribute of mercy. In the beginning, plan A, remember we have plan A and plan B? Plan A is Edom Arishon will do the right thing, will not sin, right? On plan A, Hashem wanted to create the world and run it according to the attribute of judgment. But the attribute of judgment is very serious. It's very high standard. Judgment means if you do the right thing, you will get the consequences. If you will not do the, the, the right thing, you will get the consequences. And the consequences, if you will not obey, you're going to die, the world going to be destroyed. That what actually was happening if it was only one attribute, the attribute of judgment. But because Hashem did not, didn't want to destroy the world, he wanted to give it a chance, he in advance created another alternative attribute called the attribute of mercy. And we have to understand what attribute of mercy. Mercy is not what we think. Because it seems apparently that mercy and judgment contradict each other. Because if you want to be judging, there is no way to just, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's forget about it. You have to give the consequences. And if you choose to be... Uh, to run it in the in the in the in the, in the, in the attribute of mercy, will be no judgment. Hashem created those two in a way that they will complete each other and could coexist. How? How? And here we have to understand what the judgment of mercy. We have to know this is a very simple rule that we should remember. There is nothing but nothing in the world that you will do that will not have consequences. No such a thing. That you'll do something, there'll be no consequences. Everything that you do will have consequences. If it's good, the consequences will be good. If it's not good, the consequences will be there in the same way. Not good. Now, this is the rule. This is the facts. The difference between the attribute of judgment to the attribute of mercy, when it's only the attribute of judgment, you did something wrong, the consequences will come right away with all strength, with all power. The attribute of mercy, the change is only one thing. It's not giving up the consequences. The consequences will come anyway. But here's the difference. If you know there are, in the attribute of mercy, 13 channels. You heard about meaning there is a judge, a, a, a title called attribute of mercy, but it divided to 13 ways, right? What are they? Hashem, Hashem, Kel, Rachum, Vechanun, Erech, Apayim, Verav Chesed, Vehemed, right? Remember this from the Tefillah? This, those are the 13th attribute of mercy. One of them is Erech Apayim. What is Erech Apayim? Er Af is uh, um, um, an illustration way to speak about anger. You know, when somebody's really, really anger, it's look like a smoke coming out of his nose. He's really angry, right? That's called Charon Af. Erech Apayim, meaning that you did something that caused me really to be mad, really, really angry, but I'm holding it up. I'm not responding right away. Meaning you did something terrible. It's really 
cause me to be angry. But I'm, I'm holding myself and I'm not doing it right away. When I'm going to do it? A little bit later on. What are you going to gain by this? You're going to gain by this the following. If it was only the, judge, the attribute of judgment, you did something wrong, immediately you're going to pay for it. Immediately. On the spot. The attribute of mercy will say, you did something wrong, there is a terrible consequence that going to come. But it's not going to be right away. It will be in another five minutes. Another hour. What are you going to gain from this? That you could fix it before the time will pass. Let me give you an example. Imagine somebody was very, very depressed, decided that the best thing for him to do is to commit suicide. So he went to the drugstore, took a poison, put it in water, and drank it. It's a lethal poison. After he finished to drink it, he regretted it. And he said, no, 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 actually, I have more work to do in this world. So I'm really sorry, but um, I don't want to commit suicide. Too late, right? It's in the system already. Imagine that there is something that could neutralize. I don't know how to say it. The neutralize. neutralize it. So if he is lucky enough, he could go run back to the drugstore, take the drug that will neutralize it, drink it, and if he will do it on time, it will not affect him, right? But there is very, very limited time to do it. Now, if you did it, the consequences will not come. If you didn't, the consequences will come. And this is the idea of the attribute of mercy. You did something wrong. You got to pay for it. If it will be right away, you will have no chance, no time. The time that will, Hashem gave you when he used the attribute of mercy is for you to fix it before it will apply. If you did it, you did it. You saved yourself. If not, then the consequences will come. Okay? Now, when Adam Arishon sinned and didn't obey Hashem, he brought on himself and on the world death, destruction. Hashem told him that in advance. Because Hashem didn't want to do it right away, he wanted to give the human being, and if you want, the human race, ability to fix it before it will be too late, then he used the attribute of mercy. And against or parallel to each day in the creation, he gave us a chance of a thousand years. Therefore, we could understand why we have 6,000. Each thousand is parallel to one day of the creation. So now we understood what is Ha'olam Azeh. Ha'olam Azeh is those 6,000 years. Still, we have to understand what is the mystery of the 1,000 that the world will be destruction, destructive. And I told you it's not a destruction, destructive destruction, but it's a, a const, const, construct, const, constructive de, uh, destruction. What is the meaning of this? To understand this, we have to understand the secret of Shabbat. What is Shabbat? Hashem created the world in six days, right? In the seven days, he, I don't know how to translate this to English, who Shabbat me'asiyah, he stopped doing. He ceased from working. This is, okay, I, I will insist that this is a good translation. Okay, he ceased, he stopped, he stopped doing what he's doing, right? This is the meaning of Shabbat, Shvita. Shvita is lishbot mi melacha, right? Now. Imagine somebody who never in his life keeps Shabbat. And one day he decided, listen, I'm a Jew. Let me try to keep Shabbat. Without, you know, first time, first time in his life. His Shabbat will be very miserable if he's not ready. Right? Everything that he used to do, he, he are not allowed to do. Don't turn on the light, don't hear music, don't go in the car, don't go shopping, nothing. Right? So we'll be really miserable. 
Therefore, many people who never keep Shabbat try to delay it if they want to, to think about the idea because it's scary. Well, I could not do anything. So it seems that Hashem wants you in Shabbat to be disconnected from the physical dimension. Shabbat is a pleasure for somebody who keeps Shabbat. We are not suffering on Shabbat when we keep Shabbat. We enjoy Shabbat very much. What is the secret? The secret is that we have body and soul. Many people, the vast majority of the people in the world, are aware that they have a body. They have no choice. They know that they have a body and the body has needs, right? The vast majority of the people in the world have no clue that they have a soul. And they are not taking it in account, the soul, when they're running their life. The meaning of it, that they're living their life only partial. They have a big thing, out of it, they know about the physical dimension. And the Western society just give us the illusion that the body is everything. And if you make your body happy, you did it. The fact is that if you take the people who has all the abilities, the means, to make their body very spoiled, Everything that the body wants, they give it to it, right? Apparently, they should be the most happier people in the world. The fact is that they are the most frequent patient of psychologists and psychiatrists because they feel that something is missing. What is this? The neshama, the soul, says, you neglected me. What about me? I need also something. But they don't know how to translate it. Right? The Torah says, Lo nitnu shabbatot v'yamim tovim, ela kedel asok ba'im batorah. Why Hashem gave us this gift called Shabbat? In order for us to just keep quiet, disconnect from the physical, and discover your spiritual dimension. If everything, the meaning of myself, if I identify myself with the physical, I know nothing about my hidden spiritual part. And actually, in a way, psychologically, I'm afra afraid to relate to it. Because there is nothing there. It's empty. Therefore, I need music. I need cell phone. I need to do something. If, if you'll not let me to do it even for five minutes, I feel like in prison. But if you really know what the gift, the gift is, just come down, disconnect from the physical, discover your real you, your, your spiritual part. Adam Arishan missed this when he sinned. He took the physical and make it the major, this is the thing. Shabbat is amazingly enjoyable for people who know about the spiritual dimension in themselves and in the world. Shabbat is the most scary think for people who has all their meaning of life is in the physical. If you disconnect them from there, you just disconnect them from life. Right? And this is the meaning that for the seven millennia will be a 1,000 years of Shabbat. So for people that this is all their life, physical, it will be a complete distraction. But for the people who knows that the physical is only part and there is spiritual, that will be a great, big, thousand years of Shabbat. So the, sec the seventh millennia is a destruction of the physical in order to flourish the spiritual. Now, when we got to the end of this Shabbat, big Shabbat of the thousand years, at Motzei Shabbat, at the end of this Shabbat, then we'll as the Tanz of Eliyahu says, Shav HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ulesof Elef Shana At the end of this six, of this 1,000 years, Shav HaKadosh Baruch Hu Umechadeshet Olamo Here, Hashem will renew the world, but don't make the mistake. It's not renewing the world, meaning it's a better version of this one. It's a completely a new one. And this is HaOlam Haba. 
העולם הבא, according to this, gonna start at the end of the seven millennia. Now, let's go back to the first statement that I, did, I made here. When a person finished his life in this world, let's say today, or a hundred years ago, the neshama separate the body. The body goes to the ground. The neshama could not go to the world to come because the world to come is far from us a thousand years and another 226, if we're talking about today, right? So there is no such a thing yet, time-wise. Time we do not have this. So therefore, there is something called Olam HaNeshamot. What is Olam HaNeshamot? And here we come to very interesting information. First of all, we have to know the following. As we said, every human being is a combination of body and soul. The question is, how, when, when people ask you how old are you, many people calculate it from the birth, right? If you want to be exact, even in the physical dimension, you have to add to this nine months. Because it's from the conception, right? But the question is, when actually we, each one of us, started? By the birth, by the conception? The answer is divided into two. If we're talking about the physical, yes, it's in the conception. But if you're talking about the soul, about the neshama, is the neshama just created at the conception? And the answer of the Kabbalah of this is no. All the neshamot, all the souls of all the people who live today and live since Adam Arishan to the end of days, all those souls were created in the six days of the creation. And actually the Kabbalah teach us that when Hashem created the souls, He created only one. And this is what's mentioned in the Pasuk. Only one. When Hashem created Chava, He took her body and separated from the body of Adam. The Kabbalah says that Hashem took this one neshama that He gave to Adam, divided to two, and half was in the body of Adam, half was in the body of Chava. Now, the question is, okay, what will be the next generation? The body will not be coming from dust from earth. Only two people, only one person actually, was created this way. Adam and Chava doesn't have any father and any parents, any father and mother, right? Adam was created from dust and Chava from the bones of Adam. Okay? But their children get their physical from the parents, right? From the father and the mother. The neshama they got from Hashem. Says the Kabbalah, and this is something very deep, it's called include all the secret of reincarnation and all this thing. The neshama of Adam and Chava was actually one neshama that after Hashem created Chava was divided to two and half of it was by Adam, half of it was by Chava. The Kabbalah says the following. When Adam and Chava disobey God and sin, it's not just that they get put themselves in a state of mortality. It was a spiritual damage to their neshama. Spiritual damage. To the neshama. The consequences was or described in the Kabbalah, and it's not the way you think it. You, you, you hear it. It's just a parable. Like a big thing that was exploded and become billions of sparks. In the Kabbalah, it's called Nitzotzot Nishmat Adam Arishon. Billions of sparks. If you take all the sparks and put them together, you'll get the neshama of Adam Arishon. Now, what happened actually is the following. Each one of those sparks is up there in the Olam HaNeshamot, in the world of souls. Each one of these sparks has a potential to be complete, but because of the sin, it's not complete. And it could not stay incomplete. It should wait until it's time to come to this world, be connected with a physical body, and partnership with this body based on the mission 
or the potential that has to be actualized, according to that, Hashem is this, the, this, deciding to which body this soul will go, if that will be a, 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 a man or a lady, if that will be a Jew or a non-Jew. Based on this, based on the potential of the soul, Hashem choosing the quality of the body, because every soul has a potential, and it's got tools to actualize those potentials. So everybody needs different potentials, different qualities, right? According to the mission, it's in advance decided how long this person gonna live. All of these are tools, and here the only thing that we are involved, what we are doing with the body and the soul that we got. We didn't create our body, we didn't even choose our body. We didn't choose our neshama. And this is the meaning of what Chazal says, Hakol bidei shamayim, chutz mi'irat shamayim. Everything is predestined. You didn't choose your parents, you didn't choose your body, you didn't choose your soul, nothing. You are giving in order to give it back. Meanwhile, you have a mission to do. And this is the mission of every human being. After 6,000 years, when all of those sparks will come, spiritual sparks will come and be partner of the of body, and based on the free will, it's your way to choose if you actualize it in the right way or in the wrong way, with the consequences, right? After 6,000 years, all those souls will get the chance to either complete themselves or to destroy themselves. After the 6,000 will be an event, major event, called Yom Hashem HaGadol Ve'anura. That will be at the end of days. This is the last Pasuk in the Nevi'im, in Nevoat Malachi. Hine Anochi, Sholeach Lachem Et Eliyah HaNavi, Lifnei Bo Yom Hashem HaGadol Ve'anura. And the, the Prophet told us that before the end of the sixth millennia, Hashem will send Eliyahu Navi. Be aware of this, that Eliyahu Navi was the only prophet that never died. All the Navim that we had, all the prophets died. Eliyahu went with his body up to the sky, if you remember the story in Sefer Melachim, right? And he has a mission in the world. One of them, is to come at the end of days to tell us who is the Mashiach. The Mashiach is the person that is in the descendants, the dynasty of David and Melech, that's gonna be, there are three major neshamot, again, information from the Kabbalah. There are three major souls in the history. The initials of their names are the letters Aleph, Dalet, Mem, Adam. And the Kabbalah says, the Aleph is Adam Arishon, the Dalet is David Amelech, and the Mem is Mashiach, Mashiach ben David. And those three was the beginning. Adam Arishon, who made the sin and made the Kilkul, the, he, he made the world, he destroyed the world. David will be the one that will be in the history close to the middle. And he will be the king of Israel, David Melech Israel. Even though historically Shaul was the first before, but Shaul lost it, and David became the king, right? The king of Israel means, again, we have to add to this a lot of other information. Adam sinned, and all of his descendants chose to go in his way. Only 20 generations after the sin, one of his descendants, Avraham Avinu, decided that something wrong. He realized that something wrong. 20 generations doing the wrong thing. Mi Adam ve'ad Noach, then come the Mabul, the, the flood that destroyed everything. After the Mabul, another 10 generations, they didn't learn a thing, and they tried to build this tower of Babylon to, to rebel against Hashem. At this generation was one person that the Pasuk, called him Avraham HaIvri. And the Medrash says, Lama Avraham HaIvri? 
why he was called Abraham the Hebrew? שהוא עומד מעבר אחד, וכל העולם כולו עומד מעבר אחר. He was the only one that was in the right side, and everybody else was in the other wrong side. Meaning, they continue in the wrong path of the sin of Adam Arishan. Avraham Avinu decided to fix. And Hashem chose him and told him, you, but not just you. Ve'e'escha le'goi gadol. I will make out of you a great nation. And this nation will do the mission for the, in the name of the entire human race, in the entire universe, actually, to fix what Adam Arishan destroyed. And later on, Hashem made a covenant between us, meaning the descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov in Ma'amad Ar Sinai. And we said, yes, we're going for this. Na'asev and Ishma. Be, be aware of the following. Adam Arishan, actually, the sin was that he accept on himself other authority than God. God told him to do something. The other authority, which is the sitracha, the other side, told him to do the, the opposite. And he listened to the other. He didn't listen to God. Meaning he rebelled against God, against the authority of God. Abraham Avinu did just the opposite. Against the entire world, he said, there is only one power, only one Hashem. His descendants, by Muhammad al-Sinai, said all together, and this is an amazing thing by itself. You know why? Why it's so amazing? You know Jews? You know the following about the Jews? Two Jews, three opinions. Jews could not agree about anything. Not with our friends and not with ourselves. We are so complicated. Everybody has an opinion, right? We are not agreeing about anything. There's no way that you'll take a group of Jews and all of them agree about something. It happened only once in the history. You know when? When Hashem offered us the spiritual truth. Hashem sent Moshe Rabbeinu to us and he said, are you, are you going to accept my authority? It's mentioned in the Torah, Vayanu kol ha'am yachdav vayomru kol asher diber Hashem na'asev nishma. Everybody. Not even one in the, in the opposition, which says that the only way that we could unify the Jews, Jews will be unified only around one thing. Nothing less than the absolute truth. When we do not agree with each other, meaning that each one of us realize that the other person is not saying everything, is not relate to everything. When it's revealed clearly as it happened in Muhammad al-Sinai, Everybody agree. And that was going to happen at the end of days. Not that just by Jews. It's mentioned at the end of days. Everybody will accept that Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad. But meanwhile, we have the mission to do it. Now, when we're talking about the Jews, the Jews has this mission. All the others didn't want to take part of it. They, they feel very comfortable to go on the path of Adam Arishan. We are the only one who took on ourselves to do the right thing and to accept the instructions of God of how to operate right, how to manage our life right in this world. Now, what's going to happen is the following. From now, let's just speak in brief about this because I don't see that we're going to cover more than that now. We are now here. This is the date. We have another 226 years. This era, from here to the end of the sixth millennia, called in the language of the prophets, the end of days, acharit hayamim. What's gonna happen at the end of days? It's a name of, of, of era. And in this era, in the Tanakh, in the all 24 books of the Tanakh, you will find that the prophets that were sent at the time when it was prophecy to the Jewish nations, to the other nations in the world, to give them messages from God. One of the things that the prophets says to people, Jews and non-Jews, is a prediction of events that are going to happen. Many of the events that they were sent to say happened at their time. But there are few places in the Tanakh 
that the Nevi'im, the Prophet says that this event gonna happen, but not now. It's gonna happen at the end of days. So if you take together all the major things from all the Tanakh, of the event, the list of the events that are gonna happen at the end of days, I made a little short list Look at this. This is all the things that are going to happen from now, must happen from now to the end of the sixth uh, millennium. Okay? Another in the following, in the next 20, 226 years. Oh, now I have to translate it to English. Okay. The first thing is Kibbutz Galuyot. Kibbutz Galuyot is gathering the Jews from all over the world, wherever they are. And there is no rule, no place in the world that Jews didn't get there. So Hashem says that He's gonna gather everybody and bring them back, all the Jews from wherever they are to Eretz Israel. And this is the notion of Kibbutz Galuyot. We, we mentioned that three times each day in the praying of Tfilat Shmonesrei. Kibbutz Galuyot, the Israelis of you, you have to know. That Kibbutz Galuyot is not just the name of a bridge in Tel Aviv. There is <laughs> Gesher Kibbutz Galuyot, right? It's, it's, it's an idea, it's a notion. And this is an amazing idea. You know what's amazing about this? Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it in the Torah 300, 30, 300 years ago. That if the Jews will sin, they will go to exile, but the exile will not be forever. Let me quote to you in Hebrew, the verses in Sefer Dvarim, when Moshe Rabbeinu, before we enter first time to the land of Israel, Moshe Rabbeinu says the following, V'shav Hashem Elokecha et shvutcha v'richamecha, V'shav v'kibetzcha mibin kol ha'amim asher afitzcha Hashem Elokecha shama. Im yeh nidachacha b'kce ha'shamayim, in the very far place, Misham yikachacha Hashem, yikabetzcha Hashem Elokecha v'misham yikachecha, והביאך אל הארץ אשר ירשו אבותיך וירשתה. משה רבנו says, Hashem will take the last Jew that will be in the very very far place and bring them back to the land of Israel. Today when we sing this, we do not see how amazing it is. But if you go back in the history, let's say 150 years ago. Where were the Jews 150 years ago? Was not Yet, the state of Israel, very few Jews was in, at the land of Israel at the time, 150 years ago. For close to 2,000 years, they are scattered all over the place, all over the world. And yet, each one of them says three times a day, I know that one day we're going to go to the land of Israel. So how long you could carry this hope? A year, two, ten a hundred, we're talking about 2,000 years. This hope was the one who hold us surviving, alive. We knew that it's a matter of time, but at the end we will go to the land of Israel. Today we know that this amazing thing happening, not completed yet, you know, there is a state of Israel, but even 70 years after almost the state is there, we have to know that in numbers, less than 50% of the Jewish people are living in Israel. The others still is in, are in exile. But we know that one day everybody will go there. We know it, but there is no rational ground for it. Only one thing, if you know it. We are not normal. The Jewish people is the most un not normal pr people in the world. Everything that happened to us during the history was just against the laws of nature. So we're used to this. And the more it doesn't make sense, it's probably this is the thing that's going to happen. Th those are the precedent of everything that happened to us. So it's going to happen. So the Nebua says, the Nevim says, that it must happen before the end of the sixth millennia. What? That all the Jews will be gathered from exiles and come back to the land of Israel. It's mentioned in different places in the Tanakh and the Prophets of the Prophets. Now, the other thing, many people are not really aware of this. This is also an amazing thing. Flourishing of the land. Prichat Hashmama Ba'aretz. 
in order to understand this. Hashem says to us, after we sign a contract with Him, and we sign a very serious contract with Him, in Sinai, we said, Naseh Nishma, we accepting. What we accepting? That God is our leader, and we should follow His instructions. We took this, we took this as a national obligation. Hashem says, you know, in the Tanakh, in the words of the prophets, in many places you will find that the connection between us and God is a parable to a very romantic story between uh, Shira Shirim is one place, between a husband and a wife, right? Shira Shirim is the, the, the the, the sings of songs, right? Describe. Okay, whatever it is. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Uh, it, it's very romantic. So what's the story? It was a poor, poor lady that was kidnapped and tortured by very cruel people. And then come her savior and beat up the people, the bad people, the, the cruel people that tortured her, saved her and fell in love with her and offered her to get married. And he said, the, sent the matchmaker, which was Moshe Rabbeinu, and he sent with him the request or the question, the f famous romantic question, will you marry me? She answered, of course. And then it was a wedding. The wedding happened at Sinai. And the Medrash says, that the ring was the Ten Commandments and the Torah that Hashem gave her. And she accepted. Sure enough, it took her 40 days only to go with somebody else. Chet Egel. And Hashem says, Lo al panai. And Hashem says, I love you so much, I will give you everything you want, but don't even dare to think to go with somebody else. And we did it because we are stubborn. And we got a punishment. You know, in the wedding, there is the part that, the part that you know, the, the, the husband, the groom, give that ring to the, to, the, to the bride, right? But in the Jewish weddings, we have also another thing under the chuppah. It's called ktuba. Somebody reading. A whole agreement between the husband and the wife. It's in Aramaic. So many people do not, even Hebrew speakers, they do not understand the word for what's going on over there. And everybody busy to find the place in, uh, around the tables. So nobody really think about what actually is the ktuba. But the ktuba is a very serious thing. It's a business contract between the husband and the wife. The obligation of the husband to the wife, the obligation of the wife to the husband. We got the ktuba from Hashem. It's mentioned in the Torah in a few places. One of them is in Parashat Bechukotai, at the end of Sefer Vaikra. Hashem says the following. The groom says to the bride, and this is the ketubah. If you will stand behind, behind your covenant to me, uh, that we sign, that you will be faithful to me, I, says the groom, will take care of everything you need. Physical security, money, and there will be no war, will be peace, if you will listen, if you will be honest with what you signed with me. But in the Ketubah, in the same place, it's mentioned the following, but if you will not, it's mentioned in the beginning, everything that actually happened to us during the history. And Hashem says about one of the details was the following. Even though Hashem brought us to a very good land, Eretz Tova Urechava, Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash, Hashem said, I'm going to give you this land, and this is a very good land, physical quality, but more than that, a spiritual quality, that will be yours. If you will break the agreement between me and you, I'm not going to let you stay in the land. And those are the words of the verse in Vayikra. I will make the good land deserted. 
ושממו עליה אויביכם היושבים בה. If your enemies will come and try to settle down there, they will not be successful in this. They will sit in it when it will be deserted. ושממו עליה אויביכם היושבים בה. And what with you? ואתכם עזרי בגויים. And you will go to exile. So the amazing thing about here, here is that Hashem says, and only Hashem could say that, that a good quality land will be good only if Jewish people will sit on it. When the Jews will not be there, against the nature of the land, it will be deserted. Look at the history. You see it exactly happened like this. At the second destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash, the second temple, it happened around 1900 years ago. We went to exile. What happened to the land of Israel? The land became a desert. And there are documents for this. Until 100 years ago, approximately, when the first Jews came to the land of Israel, 100 years ago, what did they find there? Desert. The Torah says exactly the following in Sefer Dvarim. גופרית ומלח, שרפה כל ארצה. לא תיזרע ולא תצמיח, ולא יעלה בה כל עשב. כמהפכת סדום ועמורה, אדמה וצבויים, אשר הפך השם באפו ובחמותו. It will be deserted against the nature of it. And it happened. And then, השם says by the Navi, יחזקאל, in פרק ל"ו, chapter 36 in יחזקאל, it says the following. ואתם הרי ישראל. ענפיכם תישאו ותיתנו ופרייכם תישאו לעמי ישראל כי קרבו לבוא. says the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin many years ago, approximately 1500 years ago, the Gemara in Sanhedrin says the following. The Jews are in exile and they're suffering in the exile. And they always hope when it will be the end of it, when we'll go back home. says the Gemara uh, 1500 years ago. If you want to know when the time of the redemption comes, Go visit Israel. If you will see that it's still yellow and desert, it's not the time. But when those deserted mountains will start to reflourish and become green, there is no better sign that the Gula is on the way. And this is exactly what happened. It was deserted until the Jews came. When the Jews came, it became green. And we see this also just happening exactly according of what the Prophet says many, many years ago. So these two are actually in action already. So we know that we enter the era that the Nevi'im, the Prophets, called the end of days. But what's still ahead? Still ahead is the following. Mashiach and Eliyahu Navi. As we said, Eliyahu Navi was the only prophet who didn't, never died. And the Hashem promised that at the end of days, He's going to send him back to here as a prophet. Many uh, Jews in Motzei Shabbat has a song that after the Havdalah, they, song, they sing it about Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi, Eliyahu Tishbi, Bimhera Yavo Eleinu, Im Mashiach Ben David. You know, one of, one of the big questions, and it's a very serious question, is, who's the Mashiach? When the Mashiach will come, how do we gonna know that he is a real Mashiach? We suffer enough from phony, false Mashiachs, right? We had Yoshke, and we had Shabtai Tzvi, and everybody could claim he's Mashiach. You have to know, Mashiach is not a joke. Mashiach is the sign that the time came, and, and if you look back at the history, you could see the following. The Mashiach himself, Mashiach meaning the person who makes the Geula. Never knew one day before he was appointed by Hashem that he is the Mashiach. The first one was Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was 79 years old, close to 80, when he saw the burning bush. He lived most of his life. He lived altogether 120, three quarters of this. He lived when he think that he is Another Moshe. He never thought that he's Moshe Rabbeinu. Then Hashem came to him and said, Listen, you think you know who you are? 
You are the, the Mashiach. You're going to save the Jewish people from Egypt. Take them out and bring them the Torah. He never knew about this. It was a complete surprise for him. Next. Shaul HaMelech was the first king, right? He never dreamed that he's going to be a king. He was just a good boy who went to do what his father asked him. Go look for the donkeys. They got lost. So he looked for the donkeys and he became a king. He came back home a king. He never thought about this crazy idea. It's not like this, you know, that you choose the king because you know it's a democratic election process. Not by Jews. To be the leader of Jews, you need to be appointed by God. Same thing happened with David. After Shaul, you know, has a problem with Agag and he has to be removed. Hashem sent Shmuel and Navi to his father, Yishai, to Bethlehem. And he told him, one of his sons. And he has seven sons and he brings them, them all. And Hashem told Shmuel, it's not this one, it's not this one, it's not this one. Finish them all. No one. So Shmuel asked uh, Ishai, that's it? There is another one? So Ishai told him, you know what? Yeah, actually, there is another one, but you probably, he's not the one. Why? He's a redhead. So, and he's a shepherd, and he's little old. Shmuel told him, no, no, no. Hashem told me it's one of your sons, bring all of them. So he brought him. And David was a little kid, a shepherd, right? He never dreamed in this morning that at the end of the day will be the king. And Hashem told him, you are the king. Therefore, we have to know, Hashem is the only one to appoint the king of the Jewish people. And the king that's going to redeem us, Moshe Rabbeinu redeem us from Egypt. David Amalek was the king when we was in the kingdom of Israel. But we're still looking for the person who will unify us. This is the job of the king. And this person could not be elected just because he's a nice guy. And many people think he's qualified. Only Hashem is appointing the king. So Hashem says, I'm going to do it in the same way. I will send the only prophet that survived, which is Eliyahu Navi, and he will appoint the king. He will reveal the news to the king himself that he is the king, and he will reveal the, the news to us that he is a real king. Before it happened, forget to waste, just don't waste your time, look for who could be the king. It's not a matter of, of, of your guessing. Okay, this is the other thing. Now, in here you have Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David, it's a whole complicated story, it's a, deserve a lecture by itself, because there is a very deep concept why we need two Mashiach from the Shevet of Yosef, the tribe of Yosef, and then another one from Mashiach ben David. That's another story. I want to just finish this, uh, this list, okay? Without, you have to know, each one of those details is at least a lecture of two hours, if I want to go to the details. But here we got, just give an overview, overview about it. The next thing is something very interesting. Everybody heard about this. The War of Gog and Magog. Milchemet Gog and Magog. In brief, the Nevim speaks about it in details, in Yechezkel, in Zechariah, and in the other different places in the Tanakh, that at the end of days will be a big war. Big war meaning the biggest war ever, which will be the last one too. In this war, all the nations of the world, all of them, even Switzerland, will be no neutral state over here. Everybody will be involved. And it will be the biggest war ever. And this war will be ending in the way that at the end of it, everybody will be clear, everybody in the world will be cleared that God is running the show. This is the purpose of this war. Who will be involved? All the nations of the world. Against who? Guess. Us. We will be the target of them. And they will think, and the calculation should be sure for that, that uh, of course they're going to win, right? And this war, they got to be defeated. Not because we're going to defeat them. We could not do it. Hashem will do it. It's mentioned in the Navi. I'm quoting a pasuk in Zechariah. 
ויצא השם ונלחם בגויים ההם כיום הילחמו ביום קרב. And there will be a war that actually will be ending with their complete, clear de- defeat. How? Three sections, three uh, steps, a big earthquake, huge earthquake that will be a global impact, a war between them, they will be confused and start to shoot each other, and a plague that's going to finish all the, of the rest and then will be defeated completely. And the Jewish people will be saved in general. There are many details. For about this, it's not two hours, it's about four and a half hours, the minimum that I could give a lecture to cover the details. If you want, that could be the next lecture. Okay? Gog and Magog War. This war is very good for us. All those events are good for us. Because they're going to reveal that the thing that we only knew and hold stubborn, we were stubborn about it during the history when it was not popular, is the truth and everybody else was wrong. That, that was, is the purpose of this war. After the war, only after this war, will be a world peace forever. And those are the famous psukim that mentioned in the Tanakh in a few places, the famous one in chapter, the second chapter of Isaiah, Yeshayahu Anavi. Nachon ye, ve'aya ba'achrit ha'yamim, nachon ye ar bet Hashem v'rosh ha'arim, ve'nisa mi'gvaot, ve'naru elav kol ha'goyim, ואמרו לכו ונלכה אל בית אלוהי יעקב ויורנו מדרכה ונלכה באורחותיו and then it's mentioned the verse that everybody for sure over here know you know why? because there is every four year every four year we have an election in America because of this everybody knows this pasuk what's the connection? when the president any, any president become a president his Jewish advisors and if he doesn't have Jewish advisor, of course, could not be a uh, president, right? He won because he's Jewish, he has Jewish advisors. They wrote for him the speech. In the speech, it's never missing this verse in Isaiah. All the swords will become a, a good things will be no more wars. When is it going to happen? Only after the big war, and only after Bet HaMikdash will be Berosh HaArim. Then will be a complete uh, world, world peace. With this, will happen two things right after that. The rebuilding of Bet HaMikdash, and a prophecy. Everybody will be a prophet. The prophecy will come. Everybody will be a prophet because since the destruction of the first temple, there is no prophecy in the world. As we said, only Eliyahu Navi was survived from the era of the prophecy. But at the end of days, when the Beit HaMikdash was rebuilt, everybody will be a prophet. The, the Pasuk says, Every little kid, Jewish kid, will be a prophet. Okay. The last two things are, and this is going to be at the end end of the 6,000. One thing is, Tchiyat HaMitim. I don't know if to say it in the English Christian translation, the resurrection of the dead. You know? Tchiyas amazing. Meaning, the people who lived and died, and the body was decay in the grave, the body will rebuild the way it was, and then Shem will come back to it. That's going to happen before the end of the 6,000. What for? For the day of judgment. Yom Yom Adina Gadol Vanuva. Because remember, and within a few sentences we're just going to conclude. Remember that after the end of the sixth millennia, this world going to be destroyed. So what's the point to revive the death at the end, right before the world going to be destroyed? Right? Only one reason. You know why the Neshama will come back to the body? Because... They together, the body and the soul, has to be judged in the day of judgment. And what will be the judge then? About one thing. This world gonna come to the end point of it. The question is, who is continue and who is not? 
Who is going to have a portion in the world to come? Therefore, the body and the soul, because they both worked in the time of the free will, in the time of the challenge, they both together has to be judged if they have or not have a portion in the world to come. And let me calm you down. There is a Mishnah, famous Mishnah in Masechet Sanhedrin. כל ישראל יש להם חלק לעולם הבא. So, as long as you're Jewish, you have an insurance. You're gonna be there. כל ישראל יש להם חלק לעולם הבא. So at this day, Hashem will summer, you know, will be a summary of the history of, history of, the, of, the, of the world. And those who has the merit will continue to the world to come, which is the world of eternity. Meanwhile, will be a thousand years that will be for them a Shabbat. A Shabbat, a whole thousand years of Shabbat. And if you keep Shabbat in the six thousand, you have a good chance to really enjoy the big Shabbat of the thousand years. So if you didn't start, start now. It's good to just train yourself. Aside from that, it's an obligation to do it as Jewish. And we signed off it. Now seven Ishma. So try to train yourself to enjoy Shabbat. Because you're going to have thousand years of this. If you'll not be ready, I don't know. Okay. The Pasuk, the, the Mishnah, bring a Pasuk to support it from Yeshayahu. And you look at this Pasuk and he said to Yeshayahu, Really? Every Jewish is a tzaddik? Every Jewish person, ve'amech kulam tzadikim. Do you know few Jews that are not that tzadikim? So Yeshayahu never know about them? So what is the meaning that ve'amech kulam tzadikim? So here we have to understand, this is the last thing, what tzadik is. To understand a notion in Hebrew, you have to go to the root of it. What is the root of the word tzadik? The letter tzadik daled kuf, which is tzadik. Just um, tzedek. Tzedek is to do something in the right way. Only us have the potential to do things in the right way. And here, let's go in the end and tie it with the thing that we discussed in the beginning. What is a human being? What is the real reality of a human being? A combination of body and a soul. And as we said, most, the vast majority of the people in the world knows about the physical dimension. They do not know about her spiritual dimension. Even if they heard that there is such a thing called neshama, they have no clue what is this and how to run it and how to manage it. Therefore, they have no chance to run it in the right way. The only ones who got instructions from the creator himself, who created the body and the soul, the only one, and he is the only one who knows what is this and how to run it, how to operate it, gave us the information. This is the Torah. Therefore, we are the only one that have the potential to run a complete human being, which is body and the soul, according to the instruction of God. Therefore, we are the, we are the only one who have the potential to be tzaddik, to be tzodek. Because if we have two parts, and you are aware of one, and you relate to the, par the, the, the partial, like the partial is the whole, you're, you're of course mi missing, right? So the only one who could do it are the Jews. And because we all said, Naseh Nishma, meaning as a nation, we said we are obligated to this, so we are tzaddikim. In the reality, some of us not doing everything here and there. Not because we do not want to. Our real want is to do what Hashem says. When we said Nasev and Ishma, we really meant it. But later on, come Yetzer Hara. And, you know, we have temptation not to do it. But if you ask a Jew, you want to be a good person? You want to be a good Jew? Are you really want to be a proud, proud Jew? He will say, of course. But what can I, I do? I didn't raise this way. I'm lazy. There is a peer pressure. When I'll be older, when I'll get married, when I'll get divorced, when, you know, every, all these excuses. But really, actually, every Jew wants to do what's right. 
Therefore, we are tzaddikim. And the Gemara says that even a wicked Jew has a lot of mitzvot. Afilu poshe Israel meleim mitzvot karimon. If we didn't behave right, we're going to pay. We have to know. No action without consequences. Everything wrong that you do, you're going to pay to the last penny. But after you pay, it's off your record. What you were left with, the mitzvot that you have. And this is the meaning, kol Israel yesh lahem chalik la'olam haba. Every Jew has a portion in the world to come. The question is, what portion? And the answer is, the portion that you did. Nothing more, nothing less. Therefore, even if you did a lot of not good things, try from now on to do as many mitzvahs as you can. Because all the averot that you did, they're going to vanish. I mean, they're going to disappear after you pay for it. It will be hard. But after that, it will be off your record. What will stay forever? Your good things. And this is you and your portion forever in the eternity. Therefore, to live in this world as much as you can and doing the right thing is so crucial and so, so important. So with this understanding, and I hope we learned here today, this evening, something that the people who came here, some of the things they never knew and we learned it. And I hope and wish that this information will not stay just here, but you apply it to your heart and try to do some good actions with this. And all of us will be a good, a better Jews. And Bezrat Hashem, the real redemption will come as soon. Bimheira b'yameinu. Chizku v'imtzuf.